conditions, frozen uh, ground surfaces there. So how do you think that that kind of played out uh, in the last several days? Well, it, it's not, it is not surprising that Russia made its attack to take Crimea in 2014, also in February. Uh, because if you are, as you mentioned, in, in that part of the world, uh, with, with a lot of the marshlands there, you want to attack before the marshlands thaw out. So February is about as late as you can go before the marsh, marshlands start to thaw out. Interestingly enough, though, I've heard from some friends of mine who are familiar with the area that it's been a fairly mild winter. So the ground is not as frozen as it normally is. And that might be the reason why the Russians seem to be relying on a lot of a lot more air mobile operations for initial reports where they're trying to set up airheads on captured airfields because it could be the ground's a little softer than it has been in the past. But I mean, weather has been a decisive factor in that theater against invasion forces for centuries. I mean, Napoleon in 1812 runs into the cost of the Russian winter and is part of the reason he loses 600,000 men there. The, the Germans who invade in World War II, uh, obviously the, the Barbarossa uh, is supposed to be over and it's not. And then all of a sudden they, you know, they attack in June and they're not where they need to be by the fall. And in October, the rains hit and they're, they're, they're bogged down in mud. And then when they finally get out to Moscow by December, then they have the, then the general winter hits and you've got the Russians are completely, or the, the Germans are completely unprepared for winter weather. And you've got, you've got to set fires under tanks to get the tanks to start. And the, they've got the wrong kind of uniform. They've got the leather boots with hobnails that transmit the cold up into their feet. So they're not prepared for that. They got no cold weather gear. And of course their offensive grinds to a halt. So it's, it's, I mean, weather in that part of the world has always been, had significant impact. Uh, let's move away from um, Eastern Europe. I mean, of course, one of the more dynamic uh, areas for, for weather in terms of varying types of precipitation and, and, and climate. Um, but I, as I was talking to General Galloway as well, we were discussing um, reasons uh, from the Gulf War to reasons why the Iran uh, hostage crisis failed because of dust storms and everything else like that. So what and this can be a very long-winded answer, just anything that comes to your mind, but what kind of stands out um, within the last half century, century of real serious weather impacts on decision-making and perhaps outcomes as well of certain operations? Well, look at, look at the Gulf Wars. You know, that the, why, why do you end up, at, why are February and March the months you want to attack if you're attacking into Iraq? Well, obviously because the, the temperatures haven't got up to the summer levels yet. So you're trying to, to attack in a time when the you're not in 100 degree weather all the time on the ground, and, and dust storms obviously have an impact as well. Um, I'm a, a an air power historian, and, and of course the impact of weather on air operations has always been significant. I mean the whole the difficulties with American bombing in World War II, bombing through cloud cover in Germany, uh, the whole incendiary firebombing campaign against Japan is 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 simply because that no other kind of bombing will work because the, uh, they, they find when they fly over the Japanese mainland that they discover this thing called the jet stream, which uh, <laughs> goes about the same speed as the bombers and the bombers either, either find themselves flying over Tokyo at 500 miles an hour, which is much more than any of their bombing tables will take or else they're hovering because the, 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 the wind kills their forward speed. They're just a sitting duck for enemy anti-aircraft. Uh, fire and, and air and, and fighters so that you end up you can't fly at, at precision bombing altitudes you've got to fly lower which is more dangerous so you can't fly at daytime you have to fly at night you fly at night you can't see any targets to bomb with precision so you've got to develop some other ways then you go to fire bombing and then you go to the time to burn down cities to burn down factories but it that whole air campaign evolves because of the problems of weather um you know, even, even if you go to the European campaign, they have to rely with a lot of indirect radar bombing methods because the precision, they can't see through the clouds. So that's just the nature of, of what happens in, even in Germany. So precision bombing isn't, isn't as precise as anyone, anyone hopes it would be. Uh, but in, in basically, though, every, I mean, weather is just one of those factors as a military commander, you've got to evaluate. It's, it's in everybody's checklist of things they've got to the check for. It's, uh, you know, one of the advantages that people don't appreciate we had in World War II 
was the fact that weather went from west to east. And one of the things that I've got here that I could actually send to if you want, this is one of the things about being here at the War College or the Army Heritage Education Center is it's got fantastically rich archives. This memo here from the, the, the archives of the Army Heritage Education Center is the record of the meeting at 9.30 p.m. on the 4th of June, 1944, when Commander Stagg presented his weather briefing to Dwight Eisenhower to make the decision for D-Day. And this memo talks through what Group Captain Stagg, what he presents, uh, stated the weather situation as described in recent meetings was most extraordinary, a midwinter situation rather than normal to a June period. There are forecasts as we, we could expect uh, heavy or, over, overcast at present, but tonight there will be an improvement. Winds blowing force five and six would moderate the four and five and three and four, the clouds would break. Bottom line is he explains why you're gonna have a window of opportunity to make the landings when they want to on D-Day. Now, the, the big advantage that for us was, we, we, we had the advantage of knowing the weather that was coming across Greenland and coming into, into Britain, the Germans did not. So the Germans assumed that the weather front was gonna stay. They didn't foresee the break that would allow the invasion. So he got things like Erwin Rommel gets in a car and goes home for his wife's birthday. So he's not there on D-Day when the invasion hits because they, the Germans expected the weather was going to be too bad for an invasion. So, I mean, it's, it's, I mean it, it plays out in different ways. But one of the, the things about, again, the, the whole D-Day operation is, is, is helped by the fact that we get to see the weather first and we have a better sense of it than, than the Germans do. And it becomes a big advantage for the Allies. So it, it's... Again, weather works and it, it factors in a lot of ways, but every commander's always, I'm sure you got the same thing with General Galloway. You know, every commander's got to consider it. it. It's one of the things that's out there. You can never quite trust it. You know, little thing, things happen that you, you don't expect. Uh, the best weathermen are, you, well, you know yourself. You know, you guys are never 100% right. They're rarely 100% right. And, and you got to be prepared for that as a commander. And that's one of the things you got to factor in your planning is how you deal with the, the strange weather that shows up and you don't expect it. So, you know, you mentioned, of course, cloud cover, radar technology, that kind of a thing. And with the release of the climate action plan, uh, of course, uh, just about a week and a half ago, um, would you say uh, that militarily speaking, which then inevitably will influence the market as well, um, that weather uh, and how we take advantage of it in the past and perhaps in the future with the climate plan, so climate in here as well, is a driver in some ways, or has been in the past, of military technology. Well, obviously, the uh, the, the current administration has made uh, you know climate change a part of the mission set for the military. So it is actually it is focused on that more than it was previously, and it's going to be a driver. I mean, it's uh, one of the big uh, focuses right now is Arctic. How we're going to Arctic strategy is the. Uh, the United, we have to deal with the fact that the Arctic is opening up, and uh, it, it, there's the, and, and and the you know for obviously for 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 Russia the Arctic is a major a major theater of operations. Uh, for us, we have we have Alaska, but we're also we're also a player in that arena, and everybody's got to deal with the fact that that whole strategic situation is changing. You've got new routes of access, you've got new resources becoming available. It's 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 really a game changer in that effect, and one of the big one of the big uh, focuses for current uh, military strategy is trying to deal with climate change in the Arctic and how we deal with the Arctic. So yes, it's going to be a it's going to be a driver for strategy and technology in the future. Um, does anything particular come to mind? Um, uh, you know, we mentioned just about the calculus of what's going on right now, uh, and and perhaps a little bit of weather drive as well. You know, you mentioned the warmer ground temperatures in Eastern Europe currently for, for relatively frozen ground, dealing with very cloudy conditions in the first stage uh, of battle today. You know, based on what you've seen in the past, um, whether it be um, whether it be invasion forces in the Gulf War, whether you know that kind of a thing. What what do you think uh, will sort of play out here in in the current, um, both weather related and non? Well, I think that those people that write about climate change and the impacts of it, I think the most disturbing potential implication of all that is the is is what happens to resources. You know, does it? If you look at what's happening in, in Africa and and uh, you know changes in the dynamic of of rains, 
where rains are, where drought occurs. Um, certain, you know, water could be, you know, water is going to become more scarce in some areas. Droughts are going to become more, uh, more prevalent. Uh, the, I, I saw a report the other day that talked about more wildfires that nations are going to have to deal with. Uh, so we have potential of, of more natural disasters. You have, again, that I, I get very concerned about a potential battle over resources. I mean, we, we, everybody talks about oil, but water is more important than oil. And, uh, and there could be implications there uh, for the whole continents. Um, so it's definitely changing a lot of strategic dynamics and, and, and affecting strategic calculations around the world. I talked with um, Aaron Sikorsky over at the uh, Climate Security Center uh, as well. Something that was interesting that she mentioned to me was, you know, the U.S. Army's um, uh, which I think policy generally of previously owning the night with night vision and everything. And now she said that our, our next goal perhaps is to own the heat, especially as we continue operations in the Middle East and Africa, as you mentioned as well. So that was something I thought was very, uh, very interesting. Know, future no, it, it, limbs. and it, it it is and, and it's uh again it, it increases your energy requirements to deal with the cooling i'm, I'm an old air defense officer and, and i uh you know the, the trying to deal with heat and radar bands and and, and uh, with older technology even the newer technology when they, we first developed the uh, uh the avenger air defense system which is a humvee mounted um plastic cupola with stinger missiles on it that we sent to the Gulf War. My, my battalion sent some to the Gulf War in 1991. Those poor guys had no air conditioning. So they went to the Middle East and you're sitting there in a plastic cupola, you know, with this nice heat gathering plastic cupola over your top, collecting all that heat in the middle of the desert. And, and, and it was very tough on those gunners to be able to, to, to stick it out in, the, in those systems until we could figure out how to get power for air conditioning but that's a considerable power expenditure to add air conditioning to everything so it, it is it is another challenge uh for you to set up military systems and, and new technology and they generate the, the they generate a lot of heat and you've got to deal with the heat of the, the you know the, the from the radios and the engines and everything else it, it definitely is a air conditioning is a big and more and more important requirement well, I don't have any other specific questions for you unless there's something that you can think of, you know, if we want to go all the way back to uh, any certain certain war, any certain battles that come to your mind that weather impacted, but is there anything else that you want to add? Well, I mean, it, it's it's always there. I mean, again, it, you know, it's interesting that we, we talk about weather in light of what's going on in Ukraine, because weather has such had a major impact in that theater, in every invasion of Russia, that every every Russian leader and the invasion has always played the weather and space game. You know, we're going to trade space for time and wait for the weather to to take out our adversaries, whether it's the the Swedes or the or the uh, uh, or the French or the or the Germans. Um, but it's it's uh, and again, it, 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 the, the, the re, it, we've we got to continually evolve our thinking about it as 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 the uh, because of climate change. And it, it, again, the Arctic. I've emphasized the Arctic. The Arctic is there's all new possibilities in the Arctic that weren't there before. And uh, and, and it can so you can it's, it's continue continue challenge to strategists and national leaders to to deal with the changes that are around the world that are opening up new possibilities and causing more crises. Um, and it's something that we're all going to have to deal with. 